Okay, let me go through a, a little bit of Smith. Now, I set up Smith a little bit before, um, before the, you know, we took off on our kind of enforced break here. But I want to uh, go through something that's core um, to Smith and core to all economics. And really, these two paragraphs are why this man is known as the father of economics, let alone he revolutionized the world um, with these two paragraphs. Um, and he's a moral philosopher figure that out. So anyway, um, again, like I said, uh, Smith is a moral philosopher, in, but he worked through how um, entire nations are enriched um, through simple principles. And what we talked about last time before we you know, went on our little bit of enforced break here was how he went through these theories that are no good. Um, that don't work. That wealth consists of money is, in, in fact, that's not how it works. And he went through that that's not how a nation is uh, made wealthy. It's not by the accumulation of capital. Okay. And then he went through Mr. Locke, John Locke, one of the most intelligent people to ever have walked the face of the earth. The guy knew Greek by the time he was a little bit after he got out of diapers. So, and he's wrong. Um, Locke. Uh, proposed that wealth consisted in money more often because it it, it, it held on to its uh, value. It doesn't, <clears throat> as we're finding out right now. Um, but the big thing is when you get up to paragraph 9, this is when things get kind of funky, and you know how funky I am. Um, <clears throat> so, he says in paragraph nine, those arguments were partly solid and partly sophistical. So understand that what he's saying is that these arguments were kind of good, kind of bad, yeah, half wrong or half right and totally wrong is, is what they were. Um, <clears throat> partly solid, partly sophistical. In other words, they were good. They were solid so far as they asserted the, um, that the exportation of gold and silver and trade might frequently be advantageous to a country. That's what the merchants were saying. Leave us alone. Let us take the gold and silver that we own out of the country and everything will be okay. They were, he, he, it's right. You just let the merchants do what they darn well want to do. Um, they were solid too in asserting that um, no prohibition could prevent their exportation when private people found any advantage in exporting them. So you, you go ahead and you make your laws, but it's still going to happen. You're going to make it more difficult and it's going to be a pain in the rear end. But even if you say that we can't do it, we're still going to do it. Think about how effective the laws against drugs are. Because they don't really, eh, they're, are there still drugs in the United States, let alone California? In the high, well, yeah, of course there are. So in other words, notice that the laws don't necessarily stop it, but they make it more difficult. And they create something we'll talk about later on, which is black markets. Um, so, but they were sophistical. In other words, they didn't make any sense. They were just blowing smoke. In supposing that either to preserve or to augment the quality of quantity of those metals required more the attention of the government than to preserve or augment the quantity of any other useful commodities. What he is telling you is that every commodity is going to be valued. It's going to fall into that supply and demand model and to create value. Every commodity, whether it's um, you know, cars, houses, computers, anything. And remember those commodities I spelled out. They are everything from stuff that we buy and sell, like cars and computers, to services. Right now, the services of uh, folks working and a shoe salesman is providing a service. That's a valuable service. That's why he or she gets paid. So does a doctor or a nurse. They don't actually make a thing. They provide a service, nor does, for example, me. I just, I just teach. Teachers don't make stuff. Um, they sell services. That's the service economy. <clears throat> okay. Um, and then the other thing is that information is also a commodity. And what he's saying here is that money is a commodity. Money is. Dollar bills are commodities just like everything else. So is silver. There is nothing inherently different about money that makes it somehow into a not commodity. It's still a commodity. You buy my money with your burrito. I buy your burrito with my money. 
that's freedom of trade. That's trade of one commodity for another. There's nothing built within this $10 bill that says it is worth, you know, 10 burritos. Um, yeah, they didn't even spell that out in the back. They, they put this in God we trust on the back. Um, well, boy, I just want burritos right now. Um, there's nothing built within the money that makes it worth something. It's like any other commodity. What will you pay me for it? What will you give me for it? And that is where the value is determined. It is kind of relativistic. It's in the back and forth. It is never, ever absolutely set. <clears throat> the value is always negotiated. What the money, what the services are worth, what the thing is worth, what the information is worth is always, always negotiated. That is a theory and it has proven to be extremely reliable. Okay, it's built within it. Um, and then he goes on and says they were sophistical too, perhaps in asserting that the high price of exchange necessarily increased what they called the unfavorable trade of balance. That gets into a macroeconomic issue. Um, so in other words, you don't really throw things off by having, we still, economists basically get this. Um, politicians know that most people don't. The balance of trade doesn't really tell you that much about things, how they're going on. Um, if uh, other countries are buying more of our stuff, that's great. Um, then their money is coming into us and our stuff is going out to them. But if we are buying their stuff, that's great too. And um, people often talk about the balance of trade and it's not that big of a deal. Okay. Now let's go to the world famous paragraphs 11 and 12. And this notion is this theory is, is really simple and it is a theory. Um, a country that has no mines of its own must undoubtedly draw its gold and silver from foreign countries in the same manner as one which has no vineyards of its own must draw its wines. Okay, well, how are you going to get wine if you're in the high desert? We don't have any vineyards here. Well, we will have cash to pay for wine that comes from Temecula. <clears throat> That'll work. But that was within this country. Well, what if we live up in, um, I don't know, Canada, which does not have any vineyards of its own? How do they get their wine? Well, what they do in Canada is they make beer. They sell the beer, they get some money, and then they buy the wine that they want. And they buy however much they want. That is freedom of trade. <clears throat> so you produce what you can produce, and then you buy what you you want it's up here that's the demand the demand is psychological what you want and it depends on the person maybe you don't want any wine but that's <clears throat> whatever you know different individuals different countries are different so without the government stepping in and determining you shall have so much no just let people work it out themselves if i need to get some wine and i live in canada well i'd better open up my brewery so I can make some Canadian beer, eh? And then the money I make from it, I can use to buy some wine because they take money. <clears throat> so I do what I can do to be productive. And when I'm productive, I will get the money and that will allow me to go out and get the stuff that I want. Notice that I am going to produce more beer and sell more beer the more that I want. My wants make me productive to provide things for other people, for other um, folks. That is basically the way supply and demand works on an individual level. And what he's going to uh, point out is that that, when you expand it, that's how it works on a national level. And this is a very important paragraph too. 11 and 12 are the key of Smith. You get Smith if you get 11 and 12. The quantity of every commodity which human industry can either purchase or produce naturally regulates itself. Naturally regulates itself. Leave it alone. And I will determine how much wine I, I, can, uh, I want up here. Well, how much will I purchase will depend on how much I want. And that will determine how much I will produce. But allow it to work itself out. Don't you tell me what I got to do. I will determine it because that will put me to work and make me more productive. Remember I told you it's not about the money, it's about the productivity. 
We measure the productivity using money. That's just the ruler. That's just the yardstick we're using. It is not actually what we want to do, which is to be more productive. Okay. Um, but no commodity regulates themselves more easily or more exactly according to this effectual demand than gold and silver. Wherever you see him talk about gold and silver, just punch in money. That is, that was at the time, and still to a degree is, but not entirely, that was um, <clears throat> the currency that was used in international trade. So if you try to regulate how many burritos are produced and how many burritos are consumed in your country, you're you you're not getting it <clears throat> okay in the same manner if you try to hoard the gold in order to make yourself wealthy you're not getting it because that is just a commodity that how valuable it is is based on how much i can use it for trade um, so let it go where it's going to go if people need gold they will produce more wine to get it over there and if I need wine, I will produce beer to get gold so I can go <clears throat> get that. So inherently, you do not pay attention to the money. <clears throat> you don't pay attention to the quantity of money because it will self-regulate in the same manner that wine, beer, cheeseburgers, everything else, the number of nurses that are available, the number of teachers will always self-regulate that is smith's revolution in economics that was it that is the notion of the invisible hand that will guide things and keep the economy running without anybody stepping in and messing with it if you get the invisible hand you allow markets to do their thing the markets are the number of burritos that are wanted in the high desert okay it's the amount of information that's wanted in the national economy that's going to self-regulate. How much do people want to know about other people to advertise, to direct their advertising? That will, if you leave it alone, be self-regulated. Okay, the same way cheeseburgers will. Everything is a commodity. Teaching skills are a commodity. So are engineering skills. How many engineers do we need? Well, that will self-regulate based on how much demand there is they will demand so much money based on how rare they are and how valuable they are and how much people need them. So it's leaving things alone and allowing it to self-regulate is how you let things go on a small level. But that is when you multiply that, that's how things work nationally. Okay. So watch that. He gets into how this plays out um, when he goes into, <clears throat> on 13, he goes into the self-regulation of gold and silver. And as he goes through the later paragraphs, he goes into how this plays out. How do you maintain a strong nation and a strong military? He will play that out for you. And you're going to see that this core idea of supply and demand, if you leave it alone, it will enrich the country by its own working out, its own process. Okay. All right. Take care, you guys. That's Smith for now.